Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome back from fall break. I hope everybody had a great couple of days off and either did some relaxing or some catching up or whatever you chose to do on your holiday. Welcome back. We're over halfway through the semester. Um, that's amazing. We only have a really, I think, four or five weeks left. So hopefully all of you are getting ready for the fall and enjoying these great fall colors and our fall season as we come. Today we are celebrating forensic Forensic Anthropology, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our guest. Dr. Perry Mintern began doing some perimortem damage study to, the, to human bone from a prehistoric Anastasi site in New Mexico. Uh, she has also studied prehistoric groups from throughout the American Southwest, including data gathering from over 500 burials that were excavated and analyzed under her supervision. She is an archaeologist, bioarchaeologist, and physical anthropologist, and she has studied and done uh, work in Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, California, as well as northern Mexico and Egypt. Um, she has worked on thousands of burials in the southwest United States and even hundreds of mummies in U Egypt. Uh, she joined the DPAA Central Identification Laboratory in 2011 as a forensic an archaeologist and anthropologist, and she works a lot to locate and return missing U.S. military personnel from past conflicts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Penny Mintern. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Um, hope you're ready for some fun uh, slideshow here. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you kind of a world tour, um, which is basically what this particular um, presentation is about, is to show you what can, you can do if you just want to. Isn't that amazing? You know, sometimes school seems so hard, and you think, if I can't get this chemistry class, I've got to get a C in this chemistry class. And if I don't, oh my gosh. Well, let me tell you about me, OK? When I was a kid, my mom gave me a little book. Uh, had a little Pueblo boy on it, Puebloan boy. And it was about, it was actually the ghost of the Puebloan boy. And he was in the cliff dwellings in Colorado. And this was a book for like an eight-year-old. And he was watching an archaeologist dig where he had lived. The moment was mine. I was going to have to be an archaeologist. So that was when I was eight. When I went to uh, college, I'd forgotten about that, because there was this really cool show on TV called Sierra. And uh, the show was about rangers, park rangers, and they rode their horses around Yosemite and they helped people out in, who were in bad situations and they protected the animals. I decided I was going to be one of those. And I'd completely forgotten about archaeology. But I didn't really do well. At, I was at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And I think I was just a little too young, not really sure about what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, tried it, flunked that chemistry class. <laughs> flunked a couple other classes, and was uh, eventually kicked out until I could uh, you know, decide I was going to be more serious about this. So I flunked out of school. I have a doctorate now. So sometimes flunking out's not about not being able to. It's about, do you really want to? Are you really letting it float your boat? Because sometimes that's it. You know, chemistry didn't seem like it was important. But once I decided on archaeology, I kind of went back to that idea because I moved from Missouri with my husband to Arizona, where there's archaeology everywhere, all right? So I got a job one summer at being a local laborer for Arizona State University at an archaeology site. I was in love. From the minute I walked onto the site, I knew this is what I had to do. Gosh, that eight-year-old had completely forgotten about this. Um, so I decided that's what I wanted to do. Went back to school at Arizona State University. Um, had to take chemistry again. <laughs> Did OK, because it was what I wanted to be doing. It was going to get me to my actual real solid go of being an archaeologist and being able to be in the field and do this work again. Um, so I passed it. I passed geology. I passed everything. Um, 
got my bachelor's degree while I was continuing to work. So I finished my bachelor's degree in 1984. I finished my master's degree in 1994. And I finished my PhD in 2006. In the meantime, I was working almost full time as an archaeologist. I was also teaching at the local community college. Not all at once, but I did all of these things. Um, I helped the local town that I lived in, which is Payson, Arizona, not Payson, Utah. Payson, Arizona. Uh, I helped Payson, Arizona get a archaeology museum up and running. It was a really awesome museum. We, we just had a great time doing that. It had a working laboratory. We actually uh, had amateurs who worked with us. Um, we did excavations and a lot of um, rebuilding of things that were falling down. We did a lot of that. So it was a lot of volunteer work, a lot of teaching, um, a lot of excavation. Uh, during that time, I became a specialist in the burials. So uh, thus, the, in the introduction, you heard that I've dug a lot of burials. Uh, I have my fascination with uh, humans uh, is very specifically drawn to the physical remains of the humans and what we can tell about their activities in life and what their lives were like by looking at their skeleton. So I spent a lot of time uh, in burial pits and digging pit houses and things like that. It was just a lot of fun. Uh, I got to meet a lot of the local Native Americans who would uh, help us out with their oral histories and um, tell us, you know, things that they didn't like about the way we were doing things, and we would try to, um, you know, change the way we were doing things to be more respectful. Um, so I met a lot of people along the way, lots of students, lots of amateurs, lots of retired people who just wanted to do something fun. Um, and that actually is the thing that actually drives me in my archaeology, is the people that I get to meet, the new things I get to learn all the time and the bridges that I get to build between myself and another person, between my country and other countries, uh, between archaeology as an idea and people who don't understand archaeology. So my whole life really has been about building bridges, and that's kind of who I am. The people here that know me know that building bridges is kind of what I do. It's just uh, kind of who I am, okay? So uh, these two photos here, this photo right here is, I'm in there somewhere. Ah, there I am in my pink shirt. Uh, there are lots of military, American military guys here with me. And we're in a small village in Guadalcanal, a village called Barana. And we've been working at Barana Village for about five years to recover 19 men from World War II who are missing from one specific battle on this particular hill. And the battle lasted about five weeks. So uh, we have um, re human remains scattered everywhere. And it happens to be in the middle of Barana Village. So the Barana Village men uh, helped us every day. Uh, they came down and did work for us. They cleared for us and moved buckets for us and things like that. And then the children were you know, always around laughing and running around and helping out when they could. Um, and this. Uh, this is actually from Egypt. Uh, I got to go to Egypt in 1999 and it, again in 2007. And in Egypt, um, that, that was the, probably one of just the most wonderful uh, examples of building bridges for me. Uh, I had not dis ever thought, oh gosh, I got to go to Egypt and dig. You know, some people really want to go to Egypt. Uh, I always really wanted to go to China, and I haven't ever managed that. I'm not quite sure why, <laughs> but um, I did get an opportunity through school, through college, um, to go for a bioarchaeology field school. So in 1999, I was in the bioarchaeology field school, and I went to Abydos, which is in the center of Egypt. And one of the things that we recovered was a, kind of a funerary rock that has writing on it, and it's the, it's the biography of whoever is the person in the tomb. So um, these are two Anubis. Uh, Anubis is the god of death, basically, the god of the afterlife. And these two were, are very stylized, and we just thought they were absolutely beautiful. So um, 
this represents my time in Egypt, and this represents my time at DPAA. DPAA, in case you missed, is uh, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, and it's part of the Department of Defense. Okay? So, um, this is kind of me. That it's really interesting because I've shown this photo, oops, sorry, this photo to my friends, and they all think it's me because it just looks like me. <laughs> it looks like something I would do. And in fact, I had a, a young military guy who worked with me in France say, Gosh, Doc, who drew that picture of you while you were digging that burial? And I said, it's not me. It's, it's actually down here, you can't hardly see it, but it says 1948. This was drawn in 1948, and I don't usually wear a dress <laughs> when I'm out digging. But other than that, uh, people just think this is me, uh, with my shoes off and a burial. That's kind of who I've been for 35 years. And it's who I was in France. We found the burial of uh, one of the guys who went down with a with a, a bigger plane, a plane with eight guys on it, and he had actually been buried after the plane had crashed. So we found his burial, and I don't get into a burial with my shoes on. Just a thing. Um, I feel like I am more apt to step on it if I have shoes on. So I like my shoes, I like my feet to be n not encumbered so I know where my feet are and I don't step on the bone, okay? And then this, this is kind of the, the, the slide that tells me that that little girl who wanted to travel and wanted to be an archeologist has achieved all of her dreams. Even through being kicked out of school, I thought my world had ended when I was kicked out of school. You, you get it through, it's just your life. You go to the next step, you keep doing, you keep doing what you wanna do, you follow your bliss. Anybody here familiar with Joseph Campbell? Joseph Campbell says, you will always be happy if you follow your bliss. And he is so right. Been through lots of times when I felt like, oh, I failed so miserably. Get yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. Follow your bliss. You can always make it work. Okay. Um, this is actually, I have these now. These are in my uh, closet. These are different currency from all of these places around the world. And when I get sent back to a place, I go to my currency box and I pick out, if I'm going to Laos, I pick out the kip for Laos. And if I'm going to France, I pick out the euros for, for France. Um, this to me is the absolute sign of my success, my bags of different currency. <laughs> Okay, so I started out my career in the Southwest. Where is the Southwest exactly? Well, it is actually defined in archeology span as going from Durango, Colorado to Durango, Mexico, and from Las Vegas, New Mexico to Las Vegas, Nevada. So that's kind of what is defined as the Southwest in archeology. span so I spent my first 20 years working mostly in those areas. I started doing archaeology in, in 1982. I finished my bachelor's in 1984. And the whole time I'm, I'm working and um, living all around. I lived in Payson, Arizona, which is right off the top of the Magillan Rim. And uh, I worked all through central Arizona. And then eventually I worked in south West Colorado, I worked in New Mexico, I've done quite a bit of work here in southern Utah. I actually worked here in Cedar City for about a year and a half. Uh, we were uh, doing the archeological clearance for the big pipeline that came through several years ago. Uh, I think that was like 2011. Um, so I worked here. Uh, we did a lot of historic archeology span in this area. It was incredibly interesting. Um, and I've also worked in northern Mexico, um, which is, Deserty, but completely different than some other of the deserts that I've worked in. So I've worked all over the Southwest in the United States. So I've worked in a lot of deserts, right? I, I do love the desert. <laughs> this is the desert in northern Mexico. This is also the desert in northern Mexico. And this is the desert in Egypt. 
Now, the, uh, as you can see from this photo specifically, um, the desert is not always hot. Uh, it's oftentimes very, very cold in the desert. Um, but you work in it whether it's 120 degrees or it's 50 degrees and blowing really hard. The wind just blows and it's so cold. Um, I don't know if you can see this in this, but uh, right here, this is the foot of a mummy. If you can see this as a foot. <laughs> so I'm cleaning up uh, this, the, the mummy, basically. Um, okay. So I've worked in Utah. This is not me. <laughs> this is a friend of ours. Um, this is Heidi. Um, she worked with us. Uh, this was near Delta in Utah. Uh, the Grand Canyon. I was blessed to work in the Grand Canyon for six months as an archaeologist, which meant I could go anywhere in the canyon that I wanted to go. We often did kind of the backcountry hikes that you have to get permission for. Um, we were able to do all of that. I became like one of those of the goats that you see where you can't believe people are actually leaping from one ledge to another because it's like 1,500 feet drop, but you just get used to it. It was awesome. And I uh, was able to do a river trip down the river um, as part of my job. So we took a 21-day trip, a uh, rafting trip down the river, the Colorado River. It was awesome. And then this is just a, a little small survey that I did. I think it was a one-day survey near Yuma, Arizona. And as we were walking along this canal, um, we found this. This is actually not something that we did. We, we're not really sure what it, why it's there, but we called her Hazmat Henrietta. <laughs> so... Um, She's wearing a hazmat suit, and she was just laying out there, stuffed with straw. We, don't, we still don't know who she was. <laughs> but uh, lots of desert, but especially since uh, I've started working with DPAA, which, by the way, I started in 2011, so I've been with DPAA for seven years. Um, this, actually, uh, you, you will see uh, later on, I'm going to have a couple of friends come up, and Eric... Where are you at? Eric uh, is going to come up and talk with us. Eric is one of the military men that I worked with. When I go as a civilian, the military is sponsoring all of this. And so they're, they're doing all the logistics and making sure all, everything works. And when we get to the site, I'm in charge. Okay? It's my site. <laughs> but I have military men like Eric who come and help me. Eric is a specialist in explosive ordnance. And so we take them with us because we never know if we're going to find some bombs, uh, some pineapple grenades. Uh, we can find all sorts of stuff like that. So we need an EOD specialist with us to help us be safe. Okay? We also take medics, um, linguists. Um, what else? Um, we take uh, life support um, investigators who are specialists in the equipment that would have been on the plane with the guy. Um, so we take a military crew, and in this case, this is, uh, this is Eric here, and this is uh, a guy we called Moose. He was our, um, our mountaineer, because as you can see, this site is really steep. It's really steep. I'm not sure, I don't think they're tied in here, but in some of the areas it was so steep that in order to dig on that site, you had to actually be tied into a system that would stop you if you fell because it's very, very steep. But that, that's a very steep hill in the jungles of Laos. This is a very, very steep hill in the Alps of Austria. Okay, So you never know with this kind of work what kind of uh, situation you're going to be uh, set down in. It can be flat. It can be muddy. It can be completely overgrown. It can be full of trees that you can't cut for whatever reason, so you have to dig around the trees, which means you have to dig into the roots and you dig out all of the dirt because that's often where the bone ends up. It's kind of in amongst the root system. So you, you never know. This site here was also in Laos. This was my very first site. And it's, it's a jungle, but the plane is right here. So it's actually in this... A dog leg of a river that floods twice a year. So it has flooded over this airplane that we're looking for. It's flooded over it since 1968 when this plane was lost. 
and it's changed the direction of the river. So there's a lot going on that me, as the person in charge, has to understand. So all of my archaeology, I'm the only archaeologist on site. Everybody else is somebody who's there to dig where I tell them to dig and to, to hold the stadia rod when I need to map something and that kind of thing. Um, now, one of the other things I want to be sure and talk to you about is I'm a woman. I don't know if you've noticed, but I am a woman. Most of my military people, most of them, not all of them, are men and they're military who I love and adore. I didn't expect that when I started working for this. I thought that was going to be one of my trip ups. I thought, oh, I've heard so many things. The military doesn't like the civilians and ooh, things like that. And what I have discovered that is that if you show an enthusiasm for what you're doing and an enthusiasm for being friendly, the military will have your back. Uh, they will dig as hard and as fast as you need them to. Um, they'll do it for you. They'll do it for the guy. Uh, it's an enormously satisfying situation to be the one woman on a site with 20 guys and they're all coming to me going, what do we do next? You know, what's this? What do you think of this? Um, it's a really good situation to be in as a female archaeologist because sometimes in academia you don't always get that respect. Um, I, I think we could probably have a whole other day's worth of talking about uh, being a woman in academia. Um, but when I'm in the field, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I had one of, one of my military guys told me once that that was what he loved about working with me. It was because I didn't say a lot, you know, when we were on the trip over and whatever, and they were all looking at me going, yeah, she's an archaeologist. <laughs> you know. Um, once I walk on a site, I'm in charge. And that's because I have experience and I know what I'm doing. So it's about following your bliss. Archaeology is my bliss. And the, the cream on the top of that pie is that now I get to do archaeology in service to my country and in service to the men who have given their lives for us. And that is just an incredible, incredible thing. I feel so lucky to have been able to do this. Um, and this, uh, this was in Vietnam. Vietnam is the hottest country in the world, I swear. It's the only place I ever got heat stroke. <laughs> um, and uh, because it's hot and it's incredibly humid. And because it's in the jungle, there's not a lot of breeze. So uh, this actually was given to me by my medic, and she had kept it in her locker for a long time. She kept it in her locker and then we actually had some ice. And so she put it in the ice. And one day we had been out on the, in the field for about three weeks. And she, um, she said, do you like dill pickles? And I said, oh man, don't say that. I love dill pickles. That would taste so good right now. So she gives me this dill pickle and it's cold. It's a cold dill pickle. And that is the best gift I've ever received in my entire life. <laughs> As you can see from the look on my face, it was hot and you sweated so much that you, your body is just craving salt. So a cold dill pickle is, is the best thing that you can give somebody in that instance. So that's one of my favorite photos. <laughs> oh, and this uh, on the top is, um, this is a site, the plane crashed up here. It's actually fairly flat, even though it's fairly high up in the mountains. And this is uh, in, also in Austria. It's just showing different places and how they look. We also work in laboratories, so it's not all field work. We have to take all of this stuff back to the laboratories and figure out what to do with them. What does it tell us? What is it going to inform us where we need to move next to see if we can find more? Okay, so uh, and that's true of all archaeology. Okay, so this is an archaeology lab in California. Uh, these are all filled with artifacts, and we're all busy little bees, uh, you know, looking at our different artifacts. We have people who are specialists in beads, and people who are specialists in ground stone, and everybody comes in, and, and we break it up into those uh, different ways of looking at things, and each person does their analysis and contributes to the whole. Um, this is the laboratory that we um, made in our museum in Payson, Arizona. We also have boxes full of things here. And this is the board, the volunteer board uh, of the museum staff. 
um, that was a just great fun. And most of these people are retirees and they're looking for some way to give back and to contribute and have a good time. So uh, that's what we did. This, uh, this man right here is actually ex-Air uh, Force, so we bonded over a lot of things. Um, this is historic stuff. We don't always do prehistoric stuff. We don't always do, um, you know, what I do now is, is historic. Um, the, the war stuff obviously is historic. Um, but uh, previously most of my work had been in prehistoric. Prehistoric means before writing. So prehistoric in Arizona and Utah is basically before 1400, basically. Um, but this was in San Francisco, so there's a lot of historic archaeology uh, with glasses and bottles and Chinese things and uh, just really, really fun stuff to look up. And then this, uh, this one right here is me in the current lab in Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. And so in this particular case, even though there's a skeleton hanging there looking at me, I'm actually looking at material evidence, not skeletal material. Uh, because I do both. I, I analyze buckles and buttons and insignias and boots and things like that that can tell us whether or not we're on the right track, whether we're looking at the right guy. And then I also do the analysis of the human remains that we find. Okay. So... One of the other things that we often do as archaeologists and as academics uh, traveling around the world is we try to help the people in the areas that we're in. Because a lot of times when you're doing archaeology, it's in an area where they're building new stuff, so it's, it's spreading out from the uh, already populated centers, and it's spreading to places that were um, the smaller communities. Um, and so what we find is that we, we have a lot of poorer people in these areas because they're not in the big cities. So we try to help. Uh, in one place, uh, the very first uh, site that I showed you at the bend of the river, we actually took, um, there was a school right up on the hill for the kids in the area. So one year when we went back, uh, we took stuff that we could build a playground for them. Um, that, was, that was my military's doing. My military guys um, built that for them. It was really awesome. We also do things like uh, in Egypt, here and here. We helped uh, monetarily. We helped them uh, build a small school for the local kids. And one of the things they do in that school is to teach them English. Because in Egypt now, as in many places around the world, if you can speak English, you have a real foot up on getting jobs later on, if you can speak English. Um, so that's what this and this are. These are our teachers. We, we pay the teachers. Uh, we actually helped um, with the, the money to build the school and to give them pencils and, and paper and things like that. Uh, also, in, this is in Laos. One of the things that we do in Laos and South Vietnam, because we're often out in the jungles, and it's an area that doesn't have much except for just the local um, shamans, if you will. So at least once a year, we will go out with a doctor. We call them a med cap. I'm not really sure what that stands for. <laughs> but we, we take a med cap with us, and he sits down in an area, and he tell, we tell the local people that if you're sick or you have somebody who's sick, if you'll come to our site tomorrow, we have a doctor who will help you. And we have a doctor, and he has, his, he has some drugs and things that he's allowed to bring with him. And, and we, we do that. Uh, so we bring medical care. That's through the auspices of uh, the military. Um, I would like to think that, you know, that I would have done the same thing, but we, we have those, that availability through our military. So we do that. And then up at the top there, um, this is just, this is more about building bridges. Uh, the three women in the back are myself and two historians that work with me. Uh, the three men in the front are local, um, I can't think of the word I want, elders, <laughs> sorry, uh, local elders um, who were children at the time of World War II. And so we're there and we're, we're building these bridges with these men who will not only tell us what they remember, but they'll say, you know, I remember hearing that, you know, this other person who is still alive 
you know, they gathered something from the site or their father did something at the site. So you might want to go talk to them. And this is often how we get information on where to actually look for men is from the locals who were either there or they, they've lived there for long enough that they've heard all the stories from the local people. Um, you know, remember when that plane came down and there was a big fire and then this is what the Germans did and that's what we did. Um, we often, that's often how we get to these places and get to the right places is because we build these bridges with local elders. So in archaeology, you can use all side kinds of tools. So you, you have to, there's not just one way to learn how to do archaeology. Sometimes you use, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Sometimes you use shovels and buckets, and sometimes you use backhoes and trucks. Okay, I've used both. Um, it depends on your site, what you need to do. Okay, um, but you always, always, always take notes. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know what's important to record. You have to record everything. Because once you're out of the situation and you go back to the laboratory, you have to re rely on your notes. So you have to know how to pay attention, to write it down. Um, in this day and age, you might actually not write it down. You might put it on a computer. <laughs> but whatever, you have to make those observations. It's very important to take observations in order to figure out what's going on at your site. And then uh, this is me in Guadalcanal. And what I'm doing here is I have the military guys around me, and I'm showing them a map that I've generated. And I'm saying, look, this is what we've got here, and this is what we've got here. And I was thinking that maybe we should do this, and then we can put the, the screening shelter over there. And then, you know, uh, and these guys then will say to me, okay, we'll do that. They'll say, well, that doesn't make any sense, Doc, because, you know, we might want to do this over there later. Oh, yeah, that's true. You know, so it's, it's a, it's a, getting opinions from other people who are also on the site, making those observations that maybe you didn't actually see. So it's about camaraderie, and it's about working together. So mapping is a huge thing in uh, archaeology. So sometimes you map with a total station, and sometimes you map with a compass and a, a tape, a tape measure depends on where you are and what you can use. Sometimes you use backhoes, and sometimes you use a little dental pick. OK? OK, so being an archaeologist. It's a lot of fun in the field. It's some fun in the lab. You can tell I'm a field person. <laughs> um, but it's also about writing, knowing how to write. English is imperative. So you need, you need to know how to write. Uh, uh, oops, did it again. <laughs> um, this is uh, one of the largest books that I edited and wrote a big part of. Um, it was uh, the basis of my dissertation was, was based on this uh, collection of about 350 um, human remains. This is my, uh, my dissertation page. So uh, this is what I wrote my dissertation on. This is the front page with all the approvals, which is what you have to do. Uh, you have to get everybody's approval, and you have to defend it, and, and all of that. Uh, and then this is the study. Just study, study, study. Um, what does an ep epiphyseal end of a bone tell you? If it's, if it's fused at a stage two, how old is that person? You know, uh, that, that end of the bone is different than the other end of the bone, and there are 206 bones in your body. So uh, every epiphysis will tell you something slightly different. So it's a lot of study. Um, and this is just looking at the skeleton. You also have to know, um, when you're an archaeologist, you have to understand how does soil move, how does soil look when it changes, what happens to soil when it's burned, uh, things like that. So uh, I have worked pretty much all over the world. And uh, real quickly, I'm going to run you quickly through uh, working in Egypt and then working with DPAA. Uh, those are the two, that, um, the, the two pieces of my experience that I love the most. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so I went to Egypt, and we stayed in Cairo, the capital city, for a while, which is, where is Cairo? It's up here somewhere. I can't even, Cairo's not on here because this is about the ancient, ancient 
So, <laughs> okay. So uh, where we worked actually is here in Abydos, right here. And this is the Nile River, which runs from this direction to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and we worked in Abydos, which is actually the place where the very first pyramids were built. Um, they're very small pyramids. They were kind of like uh, trying them out. <laughs> so they, they, they built the very first pyramids there in the, during the Old Kingdom. So uh, I worked at the Middle Cemetery, which dated to between 2450 and 26, sorry, the other way around, 2300 AD, uh, sorry, BC. And it was in Abydos, Egypt, and I was there in 1999 and 2007. Uh, this is looking, uh, this is basically where the Middle Cemetery is. It's in sand dunes. And uh, off here to the uh, west is the Libyan Desert Plateau. Okay, so uh, this is the house grounds that we stayed in. It's called the uh, Amriki Beit, which means the American house. Uh, that American house has been there since the 1930s when um, archaeologists from uh, Pennsylvania University first started going there to work. Uh, and then th these are the uh, places that we stay in. This is a beehive. I thought you might think that was interesting for this state. Uh, this is called a beehive roof. And these are the rooms that you sleep in. And these are hollow on the inside. And that allows that 120 degree heat to go somewhere besides, whoops, sorry, <laughs> besides uh, right on you when you're trying to sleep. Um, okay, so in 1975, they did the map on the left there. And what, where we are going to end up working is here on the high hill, the middle cemetery, high hill. So in 1999, we did this map of what we had excavated. So we had found a couple of tombs. Uh, this is a mud brick wall, okay? And then this is the shaft to the tomb. So they build the, build the mud brick walls up about 10 feet high, 8 feet wide, so it's enormous. And then they go down through the, the tomb shaft, they go down about 30 feet before they actually put the tomb in to the side. So it's very well protected. Um, and we found the tomb of Winnie and uh, a very small votive chapel of Idinecti. And the other thing that we found that's very interesting is right here we found this stela. Okay. This stela has a biography on it, and the biography is of a man named Eu, who was Winnie's father. Okay. When I went back in 2007, I had just finished my dissertation in 2006, and so the woman who was running uh, the excavation said, this is your gift for finishing your doctorate. You get to be in charge of digging the tomb of Winnie. I'm sorry, the tomb of Eu. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> um, so this is what she points at uh, here. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> okay. What we had done in 2004 was hired a Polish magnetometer specialist who came in and did a magnetometer survey of the area that looked just like this, but because of his magnetometer, you could see, he could see that there's a mastaba right here with a, um, a tomb shaft. And if you look at the other map that we had with the cross on it that had the, the autobiography, that was right about in here. Okay? So we, we put in a 40 meter square um, grid and went down and it was right there. It was about um, six feet down in the sand, but it was exactly where he said it was. So when we're doing this kind of work, this, um, this here you can see, this isn't a very good photo, but uh, you can see the walls of the mastaba. Each one of these is a mud brick. Uh, it, it, they're using the mud from the Nile, which is really sticky, so it's really good for making houses. Um, the brick is about a foot long, maybe five inches wide by five inches. So they make these uh, in mass, and then they build these enormous walls with them. So this is what we end up with. This is the tomb of Eu. Um, there's lots of extra stuff here, but uh, right here you can barely see a steel frame. 
That steel frame is built over, this is the steel frame, this is built over the uh, tomb shaft. So we get to that, we have to go dead, we have to dig out all the sand for 30 feet, and we go down into that, and then we find the tomb, which is to the side. And we did find that. This is what it looks like in theory. It, it pretty much does look like this. Uh, this is all mud brick. This is the outside Mastaba walls. Uh, this is a little chapel that they built on the side. And then right here in the middle is the tomb shaft. The tomb shaft goes down about 30 feet, and then at about 25 feet, you find the archway that leads into the actual tomb. Okay, so this is, uh, this is kind of a faded out picture, but you get the idea. This is what is at the bottom of a 30-foot shaft. This is what you get to find, okay? And I'm going to read this real quickly. Um, this was in um, a little magazine that uh, University of Michigan put out. Uh, the Kelsey Museum is at the University of Michigan. And my boss was Dr. Janet Richards, and she put this in their little magazine when we got back. Uh, on February 7th, this is, this is Janet is talking about me. Uh, I peered down EU's tomb shaft, then at a depth of eight meters, to our bioarchaeologist, Penny Mintern, who said, ask me the question. So I dutifully queried, what do you see? And she replied, wonderful things. <laughs> Anybody who knows anything about Egyptian archaeology will recognize uh, what the uh, archaeologist said when he, he first found the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun. That's what he said. Wonderful things. Penny and her crew had just reached the point where it was possible to peek under the inscribed lintel, exposed only the day before, into the tomb chamber of the late Old Kingdom vizier Eu. And even then, it was obvious that it was gorgeous and exceptionally well-preserved. So quoting Carter on his first look into Tutankhamun's tomb seemed entirely appropriate at that moment. And indeed, the 2007 season of the University of Michigan Abydos Middle Cemetery project was one of extraordinary success, constant surprises, and thought-provoking discoveries. Uh, this is just one of the things, I mean, this is in sand, sand, the sand is all brown. Everything is brown, 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 brown. Everything you've seen is brown. You, you, you're getting into some nice limestone, so the limestone is kind of white, right? But then you, get, you open this, and this is 5,000 years old, and it's still colored like the day it was, it was first painted. Amazing. And then this is... Uh, one of the thing, the other thing about being an archaeologist is about camaraderie and be, hanging out with people that you really like. And here I am with my friend Beth, and we're making a mini mastaba out of Twinkies. So, <laughs> and it, this is this is uh, an early version. You should have seen the final version. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> and then this is uh, this is the final photo of us uh, with all the men who worked with us. This is me up here. Um, in Egypt and, and Laos, many, many areas uh, of the world, the men will, will do the work in the field, not the women. So in, in places like that, we only work with men. Um, so, uh, but uh, a good joke goes anywhere, even if you don't speak the language, if you hide their shoes, they think that's really funny. <laughs> okay, so then this is DPAA. So I'm gonna run through this really quick, okay? This is DPAA. I had to put that photo in because that's my favorite place in the world. That's Mont Saint-Michel in France. It's incredible. If you could ever go there, you need to go. It's just an incredible place. So my job with DPAA has allowed me to travel all over the world. It's allowed me to meet people in, you know, Laotians, people from Thailand, people from the backwoods of Austria that I would have never met before. And it's just an incredible way of learning about humanity and uh, how different people can be, and yet we are all the same. Okay. Um, we find skeletons. Uh, that's a skeleton of, of a soldier. Um, I believe that's probably from the USS Oklahoma. Um, we, we use everything, not just the skeletons and the DNA, but we also use um, things that are found with them. So in this particular case, um, this is a pin cap. So it was a really nice pin with a golden cap. And it had his name engraved on it. Uh, I believe his name was Lynn Hadfield. And that was found in the same area that we found some remains. And so this is a really good indication that we're in the right spot. We have the right guy. Okay. And uh, this is me in Vietnam. And I'm uh, looking at a flight suit. 
basically. I'm down in the dirt and I'm looking at this flight suit trying to make sure I don't rip it. And, and, and in this particular case, there were so many termites at this site that we didn't recover our guy, but we found so much of the stuff that would have been with him that we could say with certainty that he was there, he was in the crash, he didn't survive. So we didn't get his remains, but we got enough circumstantial evidence that we could say that he was there. Um, this is the beaches of Normandy. Uh, on D-Day uh, anniversaries, they, uh, they walk out and they you know, they know how many men died just on the beach in Normandy. Americans and Australians and uh, British men who were landing, they know exactly how many people died on, this is Utah Beach. And uh, they put a silhouette of a man down for every man who died. Okay? Um, this is also just up above, this is the American Cemetery in uh, France in, at Normandy. And what I'm doing here is this is after we have recovered the guy that was in the burial I was telling you about. I was in the burial with my bare feet. His name was John Canty. And we had recovered him and he had been buried with his dog tag. It's an, just an enormous feeling when you, when you get to do that. And so we went to this cemetery and there's a wall of all the missing men. And so this is a photo of me pointing to the name of John Canty. And I'm saying, you're going home, sir. And this is a photo of Canty. Whoops, I did it again, the wrong way. Okay. I've lost it. <laughs> Dance. Ah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so this is Canty. This was the crew. Um, it's not the whole crew. Some of these guys, this is an earlier photo, so some of these guys weren't on the plane. But Canty was on the plane. This is Canty. This guy is still missing, and this guy is still missing. We're still going back. We're still looking for them. Um, but that's Canty. We found him. Uh, this is at that site uh, showing, uh, this is my team captain and we're doing screening. We have to do a lot of screening, move a lot of dirt to find this. And this is Canty's burial at Arlington uh, later that year. Um, this is just a few, you know, we use lots of things. We use uh, historic military maps, historic military uh, aerial photos, things like that. Uh, and then this is basically, this is why we do this. Uh, these are some, uh, oops, did it again. <laughs> these are some guys that, uh, there are six guys here that we recovered at a site in Belgium that took us 10 different missions to, to recover all of them because it was scattered over about a football field and a half. And we had to dig every single meter of that uh, and screen it. Um, this is one of the little boys in uh, Laos that he loved to come out to the site, but when you tried to talk to him, he'd go hide behind his father's legs. <laughs> um, this, is in, uh, this is in Germany. This is my team in Germany. Uh, again, you can see there's uh, this woman here, me, and this woman. Oh, and this is this woman. But everybody else is guys. But it works because uh, if you show respect, you get respect. Remember that one. That's an important one. Uh, and then this is me with um, my beautiful ladies in Vietnam. They weren't allowed to dig on the site, but they did do our laundry and make our dinner. So <laughs> they were really, really awesome women. Um, yeah, and then this is the family of the very first man uh, that I ever recovered, Thomas Dugan, from Laos, uh, from, from the site with the bend in the river. Uh, and this is his family. So that's it. That's all I got. I am just absolutely fascinated about, <laughs> about your life and about all of the places that you've done. Do you know how many countries you visited? Have you ever counted them? Oh, I counted them once. Uh, I, it's got to be, you know, 15 or 20 at least. And there are, there are countries out there that I still want to go to, but I just haven't yet. So. Yeah. Do you have a, um, a most indelible memory? Do you have a memory that is, that, that, that is more, for, for whatever reason, that really sticks to you more than the others? Yeah, there, there are lots of them. There are lots of moments in this job specifically, uh, as, as well as the archaeology that I've done over the years. Um, but I would say there, there was a photo there where I was... Um, uh, I showed you the dental pick. I was using a dental pick. 
And that was a really big moment because we had just, it, th th we had an area of two football fields and I looked at it and I looked at all we knew about it and I said, this was the fourth mission there. And, and we hadn't found the two guys we were missing, uh, Laos. And I said to myself, I'm gonna look there. I, something told me, just some voice in my head said, you're too high on the hill, you need to go down and go to the right. I don't know why right was in there. Uh, uh, and so that was the second unit that we dug there. And, and, and we had dug 150 units there in the past. This was my second unit. And we found some bone, and that was amazing. We knew we probably had him. But then we found his dog tags. That was incredible. And then we found his blood chit. You'll know what that is, right, Ron? Yep. A blood chit is what they give the men who travel in the plains starting in World War II, I think there may have been some in World War I, but specifically in World War II, in case you had to jump out of your plane and you, could, and you could survive the crash or you could jump out of your plane and go down in your parachute, you would have something on you that would be written in every possible language of the people who live near you. Um, so this is written in Vietnamese and Laotian and Chinese and Japanese and I don't even know what else. But it's, it's on the guy, it's on, it's on your pilot, it's on your co-pilot, it's on anybody who was on the plane. And it's so that if they survive, they can take this out and they can show it to a local who hopefully can read and it will say, I am an American and my country will take care of you if you will help me, okay? It, it has that in every language possible, it has it in English, and it also has a US flag on it. That's part of this piece of material. And so we're down there and we know we've got some bones and some teeth and gosh, we found his dog tag. And I'm digging along and I see this thing and it's blue. And I'm thinking, gosh, what would he be wearing that was blue? And then I see that there's a little spot of white on it. And then I see there's some red on it. And then it just hits me. It's an American flag. I have his blood shit. I have his blood shit. He was here. And I have this. I had never found a blood chip before or since. The only partial one I've ever found it was amazing. Wow, and that sounds like it was a very powerful moment for you. It was very powerful. Welcome to the stage, Sergeant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and so I would love to know a little bit about what you do with finding explosives. I mean, that just sounds incredible. And also about how you've worked with Dr. Midturn. Absolutely. So I'm the superintendent for an explosive ordnance disposal flight at Hill Air Force Base, Utah. Uh, I've been in the Air Force for about 15 years now, and I did eight years in the Marine Corps prior to that. Um, my specialty is explosives. Anything hazardous that, that could blow up is what we deal with, everything from TNT to nuclear weapons, um, improvised explosive devices, you name it. Uh, it sounds very dangerous, but we receive the training we need to make it one of the safest jobs in the world, uh, but there is some inherent dangers that come along with that. Doc Penny's the, the boss on the site, and we all recognize that, and, and we all feel very comfortable under her leadership there. But she can't go out onto that site unless I'm there, unless yep. the medic's there. Because yep. uh, in those countries where we're looking for those remains, their aircraft went down, and there's a lot of explosive hazards on an aircraft besides the ordnance items. There's ejection seats that have explosive components. Uh, a lot of times the pilots had, had pistols and, and ammunition on them. Uh, some things... Uh, become less explosive over time and other, other explosives become more sensitive over time. And so having an expert on scene that can recognize those things, make the scene safe if we encounter it and get the local help in there to, to take care of it because we can't do explosive operations in another country. They provide their own bomb squad, but we're, on, we're the on-resident expert that recognizes the hazard to make sure that the rest of the team stays safe. So how, how long does it take for your team to do, because you have to kind of hang back yeah. and wait, yeah. and is it, is it hours, is it days, is it, does it change depending on where you are? It's really situational dependent uh, upon the item. On our site, we did find some ammunition mm -hmm. uh, that would have been on the, the personnel that went down with that aircraft, uh, but it's not really hazardous. I can pick those up and move them to a safe, safe location to wait for the, the uh, Laotian bomb squad to come and pick it up. In other sites, I know that they've come across what are called destructors. Uh, they're bombs that are magnetically fused and to this day could be very live ordnance items, meaning 
your, your trowels and all your tools that you're taking into that site with right, the, right, the right magnetic signature, you could detonate that bomb. And so in those situations, we clear the scene and you probably close down the site until that bomb could be taken care of. Wow, and, and you guys were together in Laos. That was mm -hmm. the, and, and was that the only time that you've worked together abroad? Yeah. And w would you be working together again in the future, do you think? How does it, how We'd does the assignments <laughs> work, you know? Um, for, for me, um, because I'm a, actually an organic part of uh, DPAA, um, I go out once, one time a year to three times a year. Um, but Eric joined us as an augmentee, which means we don't, we don't have a EOD specialists who are organic to DPAA. So we have to send out a thing to any o EOD who is anywhere in the military. Uh, that's all branches of the military. And we'll say, uh, do you have an EOD that you can send uh, to help us on this particular mission? Uh, once in a while, um, you'll get to go once or twice. They'll get to go once or twice. Um, it depends on their command, I think, more than anything. I think they, they can probably ask for it, and if they wiggle all the right um, things, they can probably get to go again. I, w I would love to have Eric with me again. In my situation, another EOD technician that was assigned to that mission broke his arm two weeks prior to the mission. And so I just happened to be the, the lucky recipient of that, uh, that assignment. I had volunteered for it. I was on a list, but I didn't think it ever happened. Oh, that's wonderful. So it was a, a sort of a happy accident for you. Absolutely. <laughs> and, yeah. and it sounds like a wonderful memory. <laughs> yeah, it was. It really was. Uh, well, the one thing about Eric that I, I told this story a little earlier in the green room, uh, Eric uh, does landscaping, and so he understands soil. I lommed on to him like a leech because <laughs> he understood when I said, if the soil color changes or the soil texture changes, come and get me and let me come look at it. He understood what they meant. Uh, if you don't work with soil, if you're not a farmer or a gardener or something or a geologist, you don't understand what it means when a soil subtly changes color. But he did, so he was like my, my junior archaeologist guy. I sent him, like, could you go over there and check? They're saying that something's going on, and I'm so busy here. Go check on them. And so he, he became my, my junior archaeologist, and it was great help, great help. Wow. <laughs> well, that's one of those things that's amazing, all the different things we bring to our careers, and that's yeah. a real special thing that you brought. Um, same question I asked Dr. Minter, do you have an indelible memory it could be from that trip or, or just a, a memory that you'd like to share from your, your experience. In my career field, I go all over the world for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, deployments are obviously are a big part of that. I've, I've served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I watched my team leader get blown up in Afghanistan. He lived through it. He's an amputee now and, and does sentry runs and, and it's incredible. And that's probably my most memorable, indelible memory. Um, but as far as the DP, DPA mission goes, I think my, my moment there was, it was an adventure going over to Laos. Getting on a military aircraft, fly, flying from Hawaii to Guam, then Guam to Thailand, spending two nights in Thailand, riding around on little tuk-tuks and, and getting to see a different part of the world. Arriving in Laos and getting on a Russian helicopter, flying to Zapon, landing at Zapon and getting around in little trucks. It was all a very big adventure. Uh, and the last little journey on that wasn't staying at the guest house, but it was getting to the site. And, and to get to that site, we had to get on a helicopter every single day. And so that very first day, we got on that helicopter, and you can see the jungles, and you can see the land just open up, and you realize, hey, there's, there's men that we're still searching for all over this place. And from the air, you could see the bomb, where bombs had gone off in the past, because it leaves a mark, at least pockmarks everywhere. And you could see that this country had just been torn apart by bombs. And... Uh, Landing on that site and getting off that plane, there was a crowd of, of natives that were already there waiting to work. But as we rounded that first corner to go down the trail and approach the site, there was kind of a mist that rolled in. Uh, it was kind of quiet. It was a little bit chillier that morning, mm -hmm. which was unusual. Uh, but this mist rolled in and this, this, this feeling of sacredness came over me. I, I realized I was on sacred ground. That, that men had, had sacrificed everything they had for their country and for their ideals and were, were somewhere on this mountainside. Uh, and that was that was a very defining moment for me. Wow, thank you for sharing that so much. I, we could continue talking all all day, and we will be on the radio um, on KSU Youth under ninety one point one um, at three p.m. So you can tune in. They will both be joining me to to continue the conversation. But one last question for both of you: um, We have a lot of students in the audience, so I'd love to ask. And you already gave some great advice: <laughs> follow your bliss and um, give respect to earn respect, those kinds of things. But do you have anything? Um, you know, any things you 
wished you had known in college or, you know, <laughs> that, the, the one little sort of parting advice that you'd like to leave our students today, both of you? I have one. <laughs> this too shall pass. Just keep going forward. Yeah. That's great. I love that. And mine would probably be to maintain a growth mindset. Yeah. Uh, when I got out of high school, my intention was to become an architect. Uh, I still have a passion for architecture, uh, but I, I'm a very spiritual individual. I feel that I, my God has led me down certain paths for very specific reasons, and, and uh, as I continue to fulfill those reasons, my life is uplifted. But having a positive attitude towards any, any experience that's put before yes. you, uh, that negative attitude is all that makes it a bad experience. Uh, the experiences that are out there digging dirt in the middle of the jungle, yeah. 100, 110 degrees with 95% humidity, you know, you're sweating, you're, you're completely soaked by 9 a.m. from sweat. That can be a fun experience if you just allow it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Those, are, those are incredible words of wisdom, and I, I know everybody will take them to heart. I know I certainly am <laughs> as well. Thank you so much for your talk today. Thank you so much to both of you for your time now and, and again later this afternoon for those of you who are interested in continuing the conversation at 3 p.m. on the radio. Uh, thank you just so much for being here today. Thank and, you for having us. And we're thrilled um, to be talking about this. So awesome. thank you. Thank you.